All right, so let's talk a little bit about the basics of computer vision. Um, so we'll start with some of the fundamentals and the sub problems, and then we'll move into classical approaches and you know break down um, a problem or two, and you know just dive deep into the topic at hand, um, due to the nature of the field and you know the amount of material that I'm covering in computer vision in the next few lessons. Uh, most of these are going to be broken down into two lessons, with the first one being more theoretical and the second being more practical. We'll go into, you know, real code examples and, you know, really be able to digest the concepts into an implied form. Okay, so subproblems in computer vision. As with all the other subfields in machine learning, there's many subproblems therein. Um, and each of which can be quite deep and have, you know, sub-sub problems. Uh, and with the rise of GPUs and CNNs, these algorithms have, you know, not just leaked to computer graphics, but criminal justice. So a good example of that is quite a few police departments are now using uh, computer vision algorithms to um, detect faces, which is, you know, sort of a... It's definitely not something that I'm too fond of, let's say. Um, having a policeman have a database of, you know, images and be able to, you know, detect whether or not it's me just by, you know, having their body cam scan the environment. You know, that's quite a scary concept, at least to me. Um, but anyways... They use body cams for object detection um, and mostly used to identify, uh, you know, suspects who, you know, have warrants out or are suspected of committing a crime somewhere, uh, etc. Uh, so that just goes to show that, you know, these algorithms are starting to have very fringe applications in places you might not think uh, there would be any use for them. And they're being utilized more and more each day, even by those outside the field. Um, I point to a good example, which is on GitHub, there is a project by, you know, not an AI researcher, researcher just a regular guy. Um, he used generative adversarial networks to learn to colorize photographs. So this is, you know, very interesting because colorization is normally a long, arduous, time-consuming process by which, you know, you have colorization artists who will go through the video or images and, you know, frame by frame um, from, you know, historical uh, context and, you know, general technical knowledge of, you know, what should look like what, they colorize a, a black and white photo to, um, you know, have some aspect of color. Most of them are, you know, pretty minimal in the, their implementation of it, but this is quite interesting because you can control different parameters like intensity, um, you know, amount of colorization, things of that nature, and it's, you know, it has the potential to, you know, save people in the industry quite a bit of money, and this guy just, in a month or two, was able to solve the problem. And uh, I didn't put a link, but just search, I believe it's Colorize Git, and you'll find it. Colorize Deep Neural Network Git, and, you know, it should be the first thing that pops up. Okay. So, one of the sub-problems is image classification and object detection. This is probably the foremost problem still in computer vision, um, and they're very closely related. Image classification, as it sounds, is classifying images into one of any classes. Uh, that's like tabular data. We can do that in a binary context. We can do it in a multi-class context. We can do it in a multi-label context. There's some versatility in uh, the type of classification you can attempt to do. Uh, object detection, on the other hand, is subtly different. Uh, instead of trying to classify an image uh, as one of n classes, we're trying to um, say is there a certain object in an image and normally we're trying to identify it via a bounding box or some similar method. Uh, 
normally the implementation is just a simple bounding box around the object that has been detected. Okay, and computer vision in self-driving cars. So, rather obviously, modern computer vision algorithms are utilized extensively in self-driving cars. Um, so, for the most part, they combine two different classes of algorithms, reinforcement learning and computer vision algorithms, uh, where you can think of the CV algorithms as, you know, essentially sensory input and the reinforcement learning algorithms are interpreting that input and converting that into a set of states and actions by which they will, uh, you know, evolve in the world. So uh, this can be things like, you know, images from cameras, LIDAR, position information, relationship to other cars, and the self-driving car will then utilize the reinforcement learning algorithms to make a decision about you know, whether to stay on straight, brake, accelerate, change lanes, uh, things of that nature. And these processes are happening, you know, on the millisecond time scale. And yeah, as I mentioned, they use multiple different streams, LIDAR, um, multiple cameras situated throughout the body of the vehicle. Um, one interesting note on that is Teslas do not use LiDAR whatsoever. Um, their autopilot system is exclusively cameras and other sensors situated throughout the car. Um, and Elon Musk's uh, philosophy is that he thinks, you know, I'm not necessarily a proponent of this, but he thinks that you can get level four autonomy, which is fully autonomous vehicles uh, just from camera feeds. Um, and while this obviously probably is true, uh, because you know we essentially just use our camera to drive, of course we use other senses like hearing and uh, that's, that's really it. I mean, we use touch a little bit to drive the car, but that, that's not really relevant here. Um, but I would say, you know, especially in the early stages of these self-driving algorithms, you know, a feature-rich, information-rich um, source like LiDAR, uh, which can be used to map, you know, objects in space up to, I think, like 50 meters um, in a circle around the vehicle. I mean, that's invaluable information that can only make reinforcement algorithms work much better. Um, so I'm not sure I agree with Elon there. I usually do, but uh, not necessarily there. Okay. So self-driving vehicles and those class of algorithms, I mean, they encapsulate, as I mentioned, reinforcement learning and computer vision, but um, include many other algorithms as well. And this could be considered just a field unto itself. Yeah, to illustrate just how, you know, broad this can branch out to be is... Um, let's think of the trolley problem. So if you don't know, the trolley problem is the seminal problem in ethics. Um, and it states, you have, you know, a trolley, a train, whatever, a vehicle heading towards a group of five people. They, for some reason, don't notice it. And, you know, they can't, for some reason, get out of the way safely. Um, you are next to a lever, and you can pull the lever and change the trolley's tracks in order to get it to hit just one person. And the ethical dilemma is, do you pull that lever, thereby, you know, having caused the death of one person, or do nothing and five people die, but you, um, you did not interact, you did not cause their deaths in any way, right? The worst you can be accused of is, you know, um, apathy in the situation, not doing anything. But this can be modeled the same way in the self-driving context where, um, you know, there's a couple ways, right? You can have the same exact problem, one, five, you know, what decision does the self-driving car make? Does it try to swerve out of the way and hit the one? Um, but you can also formulate it as the driver um, safety versus, you know, the safety of human outside or the safety of multiple humans outside. Should the self-driving car... Uh, prioritize driver safety? Should it prioritize lowest loss of life? Um, these are very interesting and important problems that we're going to have to discuss and think through and solve. Um, maybe it will eventually come to regulation, 
Um, but, you know, these are problems that are going to have to be discussed, thought through thoroughly, and eventually come to some sort of a solution. Um, one of the most interesting segments is its application in rockets. Going back to Elon with SpaceX, so um, their Falcon boosters utilize reinforcement learning and computer vision algorithms to uh, launch and land. Uh, so if you've ever watched one of the latest SpaceX launches, they uh, recycle boosters. So they have entire parts of the rocket that are saved and can be reused for future missions. And these uh, boosters navigate themselves back from low Earth orbit all the way to a lander in, you know, whatever ocean is nearest the booster at the time, um, all via computer vision and uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. And, <clears throat> you know, this really speaks to how powerful and, you know, world-changing these algorithms are becoming, um, where, you know, they're controlling everything from vehicles to, you know, markets to, you know, automating jobs. Um, and it's easy to, you know, overstate how dependent we're becoming on, you know, AI algorithms and machine learning algorithms, but it's also important to uh, preface that with the point that, you know, we're nowhere near anything that can be considered a strong AI, right? There, there isn't anything that resembles anything close to uh, AGI or strong AI or anything of that sort. Um, you know, the closest we, and it, to even say this is close is kind of a joke, but uh, Hanson Robotics and Sophia, um, the quote unquote lifelike uh, robot from Hanson Robotics that's been featured in a lot of, you know, AI is taking over the world interviews and things of that nature. Um, it's really just an uh, advanced chatbot that can um, reason about certain um, conversations as far as context and sentiment. Um, and this is, you know, nowhere near what um, a human is doing or what an AGI would be capable of doing. So diving into some more sub-problems, just as we can do image classification and detection, we can also do the same thing um, applied to video. This would be literally the exact same, um, down to, you know, hyperparameters, down to um, optimization, loss, um, activation functions. Um, you know, that's all going to be exactly the same. You're just applying it to video. And you can even, you know, break down the video to frames if you even wanted to. Um, so, you know, you have a little bit of choice there. OCR is another very popular sub-problem in computer vision where we're trying to recognize characters. So these can be things like numbers, they can be letters, uh, they can be symbols. It, it really doesn't matter, but we're trying to recognize them, in many cases, translate them into their, uh, you know, encoded form. So, you know, let's say you had a document that you want translated to text, um, and it's not you know, Word doc, you can't just copy and paste it, maybe it's a PDF, or whatever. Um, OCR is the class of algorithms that would translate, essentially, um, you know, the image data into its encoded form. And then scene recognition, that is pretty much as it sounds, it's a fairly broad problem in which you're trying to identify uh, something about an image or video that's going to be simple things like sentiment um, or type of scene to more complex things like genre or, um, you know, action, right? Um, action throughout time. Image and video generation. So another very hot topic in computer vision is image and video generation. These will mostly uh, utilize general generative adversarial networks, um, which have a discriminator and a generator. What the generator will do is try to produce lifelike images of whatever class it's uh, trained on, and the discriminator will try to tell whether or not those were real images 
or ones created by the discriminator. And this is how the process of optimization happens in a GAN. Um, and one of the more impressive examples was, many of you probably have seen this, um, where NVIDIA used, uh, you know, I think, again, trained on about a million images to produce, you know, stunningly lifelike celebrity faces. Um, I mean, these are people that you would think you had seen because they're so similar to you know, actual celebrities that you have seen, um, but you just can't put your finger on it because there are, you know, new people who have been created um, by this neural network. And the process, um, to get a little bit more technical, essentially what they were doing is sampling the latent space of the neural network, um, which, you know, essentially had uh, all those learned features and you're sampling from um, the higher level abstractions to produce um, these life faces. That's a bit of a simplification, but it gives you a good enough idea of what was happening. Um, and that that is, you know, another place where there's going to be tons and tons and tons of more research. Image processing. Um, this is fairly broad as well. Um, can encapsulate a lot of computer graphics. It can be something as simple as color correction, um, but colorization, um, any sort of algorithmic uh, transformation of an image or video would fall under image processing. And then agent navigation is the final main problem we, we will talk about. Um, and this basically just involves how does an agent uh, navigate an environment, right? This is a very important problem and it, it's very analogous and similar to self-driving cars in a lot of way, but um, in this instance, it's just the general problem of how does an agent interact and navigate its environment. Um, and this is really important now with things like um, you know, Amazon Air and delivery robots and things of that nature becoming more and more common, or at least, you know, being put out there. I'm not sure how well most of those are performing in real world tests, but, um, you know, there are some that have been rolled out and, you know, are performing their assigned duties.